Uh, we've heard, I think, two very uh, insightful keynotes on the state of affairs with respect to the political dimension of the implementation, the many policy issues, the many institutional issues that need to be tackled, and also uh, on the economic dimension of the implementation of the SDGs um, by our, our, our two keynote speakers. Um, I'm also pleased to welcome now two additional panelists, commentators, with a long-standing interest, I would argue, in sustainability, sustainability issues. Uh, Ulrich Brandt is Professor of Political Science at the University of Vienna and a board member of EFSE. Working on, on issues of international environmental politics for many years, he has recently published a widely disseminated book together with Markus Wissen under the title The Imperial Mode of Living on the Exploitation of Man and Nature in Global Capitalism, in which uh, Ulrich Brandt has submitted modern capitalist society to a fundamental critique for its lack of respecting human and ecological boundaries. Let me also add that Ulrich Brandt will serve as the scientific director of the postgraduate program Global Political Economy of Sustainable Development, scheduled to start in April 2018, that EFSE is currently preparing together with the University of Vienna and UNIDO, the United Nations Industrial Development Organization. Ulrich, um, when reflecting upon the two keynotes by Professor Töpfer and Professor Gosch, two questions um, have emerged that I would like, to, um, would like you to address. Um, to what extent do you agree with their analysis, both in terms of the political um, challenges relating to um, the implementation of sustainable development, um, and perhaps also which elements were missing or which elements would deserve more attention from your point of view? Please, take the floor. Yes, uh, good evening to everybody. Um, I had to this um, afternoon the introductory lecture to uh, um, the lecture series on sustainable development and I had the class on the history of sustainable development and um, I was not, um, um, I was a bit sad that uh, listening now to Professor Töpfer and not uh, having invited him to my, uh, to my uh, class because he would have this uh, done much better um, because he's a protagonist of this uh, history and thank you very much. Um, to you and also to Professor Gosch uh, to be here and also congratulations to EFSE um, for, uh, for this anniversary. Um, in order to push a bit our debate, I have of course a lot of uh, agreement, mainly the agreement of the urgency and the, 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 um, that we need the sustainable uh, development uh, and that we need to realize and implement the sustainable development goals. But I have two maybe not disagreements or also questions. One is we heard a lot about the holistic approach, the one world, global community, partnerships, the global uh, new deal. And um, Professor Gosch also um, outlined the counter tendencies, austerity policies uh, and others. But I would also, uh, I would like to ask you and also for our debates tomorrow, what are the explicit counter forces, the actors who maybe are not agreeing with um, the Sustainable Development Goals. I was invited this um, summer to the Alpach Forum, to a so-called Alpach Luxembourg Group, and the, it, the, the issue was the future of sustainable development. And one participant was Jeffrey Sachs, quite known in the um, SDG debate, and after half of a day, which was very similar to, our, uh, to your presentations, really to, to point at the necessity to change but then the means to change were quite, yeah, we need growth, we need cooperation. And Jeffrey Zeck stood up and said, no, hold on a moment. It's about power. It's about power relations and we need to question this. So what is about um, the power to, to push unconventional fossil fuels? What is the power of, a re of a, you, you mentioned this, the resource extractivism in Latin, Latin America and elsewhere. So my impression was mainly um, concerning your um, presentation, yet you have at the end quite classical development strategies when you point at growth and then you say of course we need green growth and we need de um, sustainable development. But I would argue, my background is more research in Latin America, that the high prices impeded own development strategies, alternative development strategies, because Venezuela, Bolivia, Brazil, Argentina, they um, uh, um, stepped deeper into uh, to into um, resource um, extractivism. So, how to challenge not only the counter tendencies um, you described, which are of course um, uh, very well described, but also the explicit counter forces. How are they present in this um, uh, uh, in these um, um, debates? Coming to 
to Europe and to Austria, my question would also be, of course, we have very, very important successes, but um, we have still, I would say, an economic policy a dispositif, a very strong orientation, which is growth, 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 and growth delivers employment, growth delivers competitiveness. For example, we had um, since February this very, very important, I would say, and contested debate ab about the third runway at the airport. And there is almost a consensus within the Austrian society that the Austrian airport, uh, the, the Vienna uh, airport, Schwechert, needs to grow. But why? And um, also um, for you, Professor Gosch, why is it important that the space for public spending needs growth and not redistribution and not industrial policies that maybe uh, create growth but maybe also um, get rid of resource extractivism in Latin America and other, um, in other um, uh, continents. So my question is, the overall question, do we need to think against the background of the sustainable development goals also as a process in a much more radical way, not only the counter tendencies, but on also the explicit counter forces that need to be dealt with. And I end um, with, a, with a concept which still uh, comes often to my mind. I think it's from Sheila Jason, of it, uh, um, a scholar in Harvard. And she coined 10, 15 years ago a term um, and questioning these, let's say, unquestionable bias of cooperation, of partnership, and he coined the term ecological controversies. Maybe we need within our society, within academia, within the uh, UN system, a, 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 a culture and an acceptance of controversies that really make those voices um, heard and, and, and um, relevant that are usually hidden when we start from the very upfront, we need cooperation, we need partnership and uh, something else. Thank you, Ulrich. Um, you've basically raised You've raised, um, I would say, two core issues. The one has to do with relations of power, which obviously do have a, a severe impact on the whole political dynamics of, of sustainable development. And also you've raised uh, the economic core issue of growth. So I'd like to hand over these two issues and give um, Chayati and Professor Töpfer the chance to What's respond, that? perhaps. Perhaps Chayati wants to respond to the growth question? Okay, yes. No, I completely take your point that it's not growth per se, which is you know, necessarily the, the goal. And I, I, I'm sorry if I even gave that impression because that is not what I believe. That, that. Uh, the reason, however, I mean, we have to bear this in mind. However many different indicators we have of human progress and of you know, desirable conditions of living, and we've had all kinds of things, right? Sarkozy Commission and et cetera, et cetera, endless. Everybody ends up obsessing about GDP growth, right? It, it, and why? Because it's simple. It's there. It's it's right, you know, in front of your face. And and even though we all know calculating it in all involves enormous assumptions and so on, so I would argue we have to put forward something equally simple and straightforward that can capture the minds of, or something, the attention of people, not just policymakers but society at large. One that I have suggested in in developing countries is to just look at the basic material conditions of the bottom 50% of the population. Because you can pretty much guess that if they're doing all right or better, then the upper lot is definitely doing better. So uh, in terms of the basic material conditions of the bottom 50, access to employment, access to basic goods and services, health, education, housing, etc., etc. But having said that, you see, the point is, as you mentioned, that the, re the relations of power impede that focus. So it's not an accident that we're not looking at that. And that's why, you know, I mean, I know Peter said this thing that we have to get the private sector on board. But you know, when we say private sector, it's always these big guys. It's always multinational corporations with this massive reach. We never think of the private, I mean, you know, the, the fellow selling bananas on a cart is also private sector. But somehow they are not part of this global comp. I mean, they're not seen as significant. So in a way, it's always this attempt to draw in that the SDGs can be a source of profits. That the SDGs also can be good for, you know, I mean, Westinghouse or, you know, it's a Standard Chartered Bank or whatever. It can be somehow made attractive to those. I think, you know, the point about the New Deal was not that. It was that there was so much social pressure that the large guys felt that they had to go along. 
not that they had to be persuaded and incentivized and uh, you know, given little lollipops to go along, but rather that you go along or else. You know, that just, in other words, you need that kind of social and political pressure. I don't know why we're not getting it globally. I mean, I, I, it seems like all the elements for having that pressure are there, and yet we do not get it in any country. So I think the critical reason would be not who are the counter forces. We know the counter forces. But why the hell are they so strong still? <laughs> Thank you. Professor Töpfer, um, you've been uh, involved in environmental issues, development politics, sustainable development at the international level for the last 30 years. How would you describe the role and influence of, if you want, the balance of power in international politics in, in, in terms of advancing or impeding political processes, firstly? And secondly, given that the international community has committed to this SDG agenda in 2015, which some people perhaps might have even taken by surprise, given the uh, multipolar world order that is emerging, um, would you see that the balance of power is conducive um, right now to advancing something like an SDG agenda? See, my experience in all those years was always linked with a clear perspective. Whenever you asked for global arrangements, you say that you don't want to reach it. We are quite now in a world with a huge crisis of multilateralism. Huge crisis. We are going exactly the other way around. So, uh, if I see America first, if I see uh, only one, you can mention lots of others, by the way, India as well. Uh, then I come to the conclusion, in this world, with a crisis of materialism, the first is, can you give any chance to revitalize multilateralism? The trade agreement TTIP between the European Union and the United States was not killed by the protest of the citizen in Europe. It was killed by Trump, only to mention this. Uh, the uh, World Trade Organization, WTO, is going drastically down in relevance drastically down, with all the bilateralization of trade negotiation with a clear signal that the strongest are even stronger after that. So that makes me my, my first topic. I see this crisis going, especially also in the UN system, going in the system. The UN system is always a bilateralization process. The financing is earmarked. Whenever you have earmarked funds, you decide what shall be done there. It is not implementing a globally accepted program, but it is linked with the interest of those giving the money. So I see in the UN system a huge bilateralization process, and what we try to do also in this field, to say, how can we make a bridge between multilateral decisions, knowing that those facts going beyond the capacity of any individual states is increasing. Global public goods are increasing in relevance and we are decreasing in the instruments to handle it. Can we come to something like a link between this? I'm fairly sure the UN system, for example, cannot finance the need of money uh, necessary for development. If you read uh, the Agenda for Action from Addis Ababa in the same years, we got the SDGs. From millions to trillions, the UN system will never come to trillions. But what we can do and what we have to do is to control a little bit the investment. Let's be a broker. Let's make something like the stamp that is UN proofed. Then you have a chance to go in concrete projects in such a direction. If I go today, <laughs> I have a lot of sympathy for a new global deal. We had already a new Green Deal when all this happened. I have a lot of sympathy, but uh, my feeling is if I go out and try to make any attempt to go in this direction, it will be extremely difficult. Simply because the situation goes the other way around. Second, only one 
additional sense. You ask for uh, the question of attractive industries. I will give you a concrete example. Germany quite now has an import of gas, natural gas, from Russia with a bill of 30 billion euros per year, the import from Russia. We are going now in the renewable energy. Stepwise, we are independent from those imports. If we are able to substitute this gas by renewable energy, what do I say to our Russian neighbor? It is a destabilization of the economy, a huge destabilization. And the main problem in those countries, I believe, and that is the topic for us, very, very, very severe, is that we are always importing only the raw materials, you know, the um, uh, uh, literature in uh, uh, those uh, perspectives. Again, I can you give you a word. I was once in Cameroon, and I was headquartered in Africa, and I had to go to the capital from the, uh, from the harbor city, on the one side, one wonderful street there, road. On one side, one lorry after the other with big logs coming from the forest. On the other side, we were driving to the next forest conference in Cameroon. My problem is that the value added of one log in Africa is to cut it, to bring it on a lorry, to drive it to the harbor, to load it on a ship, and of the value added. And the value added is here. This is my topic. How can we convince? And I mentioned this example in, in Germany in my constituency. And luckily, the constituency was a lot of um, furniture producer. Was not a very, very good help for the, uh, the election, I can remember. Because you must see that those value added, that is a resource curse, what we always mention. That's a resource curse. And we must bring much more value added back in those countries. And finally, finally, a little bit. It's always risky, as you know, uh, to mention the per capita topics. Because if you mention the per capita uh, figures, you must be aware that we have population increase different. In my country, we have a decrease of the population. We, have, we compensate this quite now, compensate is all good, by the influx of refugees. On the other side, we are going down. I was told maybe that is the wrong figure, that India needs per year, due to the development of the population, something like 20 million new jobs for, for young people. 20 million new... Even, even more, I'm, I'm fairly sure. Therefore, I'm always happy going to India to see that the retail sector is a very labor intensive. But if I go back, at home and say we want now to have a labor intensive retail center, I have a problem to do it. Uh, therefore, yes, I study this very carefully once more. I believe we have to start with the sustainable development goals immediately and as important it is, not waiting for the new global deal coming maybe a little bit late for implementing this, that we can work in this direction Take it for granted, but don't make a link with start and implementation. That's my longer answer to a brilliant speech. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Töpfer. At this point, I would like to bring in Andreas Novi into discussion. Um, as we've seen also now in, 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 in the comments, uh, obviously, there's this big impasse. On the one hand, we need more global cooperation. Jayati has been arguing in favor of a global, a global New Deal. On the other hand, we see this big crisis of multilateralism, the drive towards bilateralism, nationalism, uh, my country first slogans. Um, Andreas Novi has been very active over the last couple of years in arguing that we need a different form of economic development um, that obviously aims at social ecological transformation and he's been phrasing that in the discourse that has come from Latin America of the good life for all. And as one of the important dimensions of this good life for all, Andreas Novi has been emphasizing the need for selective economic deglobalization or re-regionalization of modes of production and consumption. So given this impasse at the international level for 
enhanced multilateral cooperation? Would you also argue, as Professor Töpfer has now done, um, in favor of a bottom-up process that kind of facilitates and, and, and promotes the local level and local economic uh, development, not only in Europe, or in the member states of the European Union, but also for other regions of the world. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the, the very inspiring uh, presentations. And I will try to link the presentations to, uh, to give an answer to your question, uh, focusing on Europe. Uh, um, to start with, uh, Professor Ghosh, uh, what you said, I can, unfortunately, I have to tell you, uh, your message has not arrived in Austria. Uh, uh, if we look what is not part of the Austrian election campaign, it is everything that is in the UNCTAD uh, 27 Trade and Development Report. Uh, the UNCTAD Trade and Development Report is about increasing inequality. Is it, it is about uh, the rentier economy because uh, shrinking or a, a, a very small portion of the population is increasing wealth uh, and thereby disproportionately accumulating wealth, uh, increasing social polarization. It is not the discussion uh, about export orientation as uh, a hindrance to cooperation uh, worldwide as you exposed it. Uh. So I think that uh, Indeed, it would be very helpful uh, for the Austrian discussion to take these, uh, these arguments uh, and your, your, uh, your presentation serious, and especially the last point mentioned in the UNCTAD report and in your presentation, that is financialization. That means the dominance of uh, financial actors in economic development. And one of the key arguments uh, that inspired me in my uh, thesis with respect to selective economic deglobalization is Karl Polanyi and the experiences of the 1920s and 1930s. And the key argument is that un, uh, unlimited global markets and especially global financial markets uh, hinder international political cooperation. And I think that's a key link to uh, uh, now switching to Professor Töpfer, uh, that is not the normal understanding. The normal understanding after the fall of the Iron Curtain in 89 was that economic globalization, increasing uh, global market integration goes hand in hand with increasing international political cooperation. The UN conferences the, uh, on uh, on women, on in, uh, the environment, etc., were assumed to be going hand in hand. I think uh, we have to uh, question this because uh, these uh, global markets have the tendency of uh, putting their own interest first, uh, and uh, it is unfortunately, as Professor Töpfer said, not only the United States. We heard that Europe has a surplus in the current account uh, balance, uh, meaning exporting more yeah, and kind of creating jobs at the expense of the rest of the world. I think we need, yeah, without dwelling in all details on this, take this into consideration when we come to the second aspect uh, from, uh, uh, kind of introduced by Professor Töpfer, integrated approach and homework we need to start at home uh, uh, with our sustainable development initiatives. I, I totally agree and that's uh, uh, really something that I think is very positive in the su sustainable development goals, that it, it's not only about the others, it's also about us. Yeah? But I will very briefly only to give the direction where we should look at and show the challenge, give two examples uh, uh, why this is indeed a huge challenge uh, and we are very far from uh, approaching it and probably uh, have to approach it in a more radical way. Uh, the first example is the automotive industry, yeah? our pattern of mobility. Yeah? Uh, we have to link the way what we produce and what we consume and how we live. Yeah? And the last months unfortunately showed very clearly how a certain productive system, yeah? the German 
automotive industry linked, uh, uh, the Austrian industry linked to it, uh, as a key driver of an economic model, being unable uh, to foster uh, a mobility transition. And it's exactly, we need another type of organizing our mobility, but that is very strongly hindered because of the jobs depending in the, in the automotive industry. A lot of interests, not only the owners of the, uh, the firms, but many other people being integrated in this, creating a systemic tendency to sustain an unsustainable mode of mobility. And the second aspect, as you mentioned, it, I will take it up, settlement and housing, very clearly here again, there is a very strong link between the increasing financialization, yeah, the huge wealth circulating around the globe, and the pressure <coughs> on the housing sector, the soaring uh, rents and, uh, and uh, the pressure on construction. And this together with a suburbanization tendency based on the, on the car is again a systemic element hindering uh, uh, a transition towards sustainability. So when we want to achieve what you suggested, Professor Döpfer, and you very correctly said, this cannot be done by a ministry approach. Huh? Uh, we have to have an integrated approach, uh, but then also we have to have a more radical approach, which implies that changes in the way we travel, we work, we consume, have to be related to our economic model. And that's why I'm very uh, grateful to, to your two presentations, which allowed me to give an argument here. Uh, thank, thank you, you. Andreas. Um, Professor Töpfer, Professor Gosch, quick responses to that? Seems to be necessary, but no fear. We go to drinks. Uh, mobility is a very good example. We reduced already, in, uh, in my country in any case, the discussion on the Verkehrswende, the change of our traffic system, because until now our energy wende is nothing else than the production of electricity change. It has nothing to do with traffic, has nothing to do with heat. Having said this, the discussion is now only concentrated, do we change from a combustion engine to a Electromotor. That is that. If you had the chance to see the Frankfurt um, Automotive Fair, you saw the same huge SUVs, but with a little other motor. That we really need a mobility change. There might be at the end also the question, what is the motor in this? And maybe there are even better sol solutions than Electromotor. If you see the resources necessary for batteries, if you see the life cycle approach of all this, it is so a little bit of what is necessary, and we're working now fairly hard to open again, to believe that you can move not only what is now going on in our cities, but that you have to integrate this in city planning. The time is gone where we had the Carta of Athens, that the separation of functions in the city is a precondition because there was noise, there was air pollution and others, you couldn't live Bill, next to the factory. Now you can, and you can integrate, and if you integrate, you are saving mobility. This is my main expectation, and this is far from being also in the heads of the people, and by the way, politicians are people as well. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Trepfer. Chayati, very quickly. Yes, very quickly. I just want to come back to something that Professor Trepfer had raised earlier uh, about how you know there's this whole decline in multilateralism and all the political tendencies are in fact the other way, and not just in a good way. I mean, you can get a decline in a progressive way, but in a nasty way. You can get a progressive deglobalization, de as you've suggested, but what we are getting is a kind of aggressive nationalistic deglobalization that remains neoliberal. So it's like the worst. You get to pick out the local guys individually. But 
I, uh, well, mainly because I can't bear to think that we will end on such a depressing note. I just want to point out that often history uh, provides us with lots of unexpected surprises and change comes w from directions and in ways that we don't always expect. And I personally feel that, you know, this current, I mean, I'm old enough to feel embarrassed at the number of times we've said crisis of capitalism, and, but this particular crisis of capitalism is one that will necessarily generate a response that is not only negative. If you look back even at the New Deal, it came from very unexpected sources, a patrician right-wing member of the Democratic Party bringing about a massive increase in fiscal spending and, and so on. You can get, uh, I think, if there's sufficient political force and mobilization and voice and even recognition that it's possible. I think what's happened is that many of us are in despair because everything looks so terrible. And plus you never know whether the, there'll be a nuclear war tomorrow kind of thing. But still I do believe that it's possible to change if only we don't give up the capacity to think that it can be done. And uh, there's too much of saying, well, you know, the political forces are all ranged against us, when I still believe that the majority of the people, including politicians, fundamentally not that bad. And if, if there is a viable option available for which there's sufficient mass demand, it can be delivered. <laughs> Thank you for this very reassuring uh, <laughs> message, Chayat, in particular that you said, as Professor Töpfer said, politicians are also people and you said politicians are not that bad. That's very reassuring at this uh, particular moment in time, uh, given the b political developments in Austria. Um, I, th I see that I'm um, getting a little bit thirsty uh, and I take this in that as an indication that also the audience perhaps wants to drink uh, something. So let me wrap up this discussion by saying um, thank you very much to all our panelists for this very interesting uh, discussions. We will have the chance to extend upon uh, these points and uh, perhaps also discuss them in a more comprehensive way tomorrow on, um, at our conference. So all of you are invited to join us tomorrow. And of course you are now invited to join us at our little reception uh, downstairs. Um, ich setze jetzt auf Deutsch fort, weil ich noch eine kurze Ankündigung machen möchte. Ich habe schon gesagt, äh, es erwartet Sie nicht nur sozusagen ähm, ein kulinarisches Buffet und, 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 und Getränke, sondern auch Musik und die historische Zeitreife und die kleine Ausstellung. Darüber hinaus ähm, wollen wir Ihnen auch die Möglichkeit geben, uns zu sagen, äh, was Sie von uns denken äh, und, in, äh, und was Sie vielleicht auch von uns äh, in Zukunft äh, wollen. Das heißt, wenn Sie uns eine Nachricht hinterlassen möchten, dann haben Sie dazu auch im Untergeschoss die Möglichkeit, äh, auf einer großen Tafel uns eine kurze Nachricht äh, zu hinterlassen, Anregungen zu geben, Kritik zu äußern, oder Glückwünsche, was immer Sie wollen, also bitte beteiligen Sie sich auch dabei. Ansonsten freue ich mich noch auf einen netten Abend und bedanke mich für Ihr Kommen und hoffentlich sehen wir uns dann auch morgen. Herzlichen Dank für diesen sehr netten Abend, diese interessante Diskussion und last but not least herzlichen Dank auch allen ÖFSI-Mitarbeiterinnen und Mitarbeitern, die in die Organisation dieser Veranstaltung sehr intensiv involviert waren, und aus meiner Sicht einen ganz tollen Job gemacht haben. Dankeschön. Applaus